Hey, just real quick, this is part three and the final installment of the series on Wild Bill Hickok. If you have not already listened to the first two episodes, please do so. Link in the show notes. We've already pretty much covered Wild Bill's entire life. His childhood, his adventures during the war, his time as a scout and a lawman, and finally his decline. If you'll recall, we left off with Hickok in St. Louis attempting to organize an expedition bound for the Black Hills. And it is there we shall begin. Tell your god to ready for blood and make damn sure your back's to the wall. My name's Josh and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. Although Wild Bill was indeed organizing a band of would-be prospectors there in St. Louis, he would soon abandon the project, opting instead to return to Cheyenne and join his old friend Charlie Utter's expedition, a caravan of some 30-odd wagons bound for the gold-rich Black Hills, Deadwood in particular. Now before we go any further, you may be asking what was so special about this Deadwood place. Why was everybody in such a rush to get there, and what the hell are the Black Hills anyway? I have spoken some about Deadwood in the past, Back on the episodes I did on Al Swearingen and Seth Bullock, now available on Patreon. And I am actually planning on doing an entire short series on Deadwood, similar to this one in the near future. But in case you're new or you need a refresher, we will do a real quick summary. The Black Hills are located in the eastern part of present-day South Dakota, a culturally significant and holy area for the many tribes who laid claim to it over the years. Tribes like the Arikari, the Cheyenne, Crow, Arapaho, Kiowa, And finally, from about the late 1700s all the way up to this episode's timeline, the Lakota, who were ceded a huge swath of land following Red Cloud's war in the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, a so-called Great Reservation taking up the western halves of present-day states Nebraska and South Dakota, a good chunk of eastern Wyoming, the northeast corner of Colorado, southeast Montana, and even a bit of southwest North Dakota. All land legally belonging to the Lakota and right there smack dab in the middle of all that acreage lay the Black Hills. Skip ahead to 1874. Custer led his 7th Cavalry to the area. Gold was discovered, and that was that. The rush was on. Now, the first prospectors to set up camp there in the Black Hills would soon be ejected by the military. But you can't stop what's coming, right? Especially not when gold's involved. More and more people continued to flock in, hoping to strike it rich. And, well, if you're a fan of frontier history, then you probably know that Custer soon had his hands full elsewhere. Now, Deadwood was a true boomtown. In a very short span of time, there were about 5,000 people squatting there in what was known as Deadwood Gulch. And although sources and estimates vary, by 1877, you had anywhere between 12 to 25,000 people all bunched in together, hoping to get rich or die trying. Just to put that population into perspective, if you've ever visited Deadwood, it now has a population of just over 1,000 people. Imagine over five times that many, possibly 10 times. The streets covered in a thick mix of mud and horse shit. The sound of hammers and saws echoing day and night. Piano music blaring from the many gaming halls flanking the thoroughfare. All that noise occasionally punctured with the sound of random gunshots. Screams of agony and ecstasy. All that with zero law whatsoever. Think back to the last episode you heard where we discussed how rough the towns of Hayes and Abilene were. And those places had city councils, mayors, laws, and statutes. Deadwood had none of that. No marshal, no sheriff. Hell, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm fairly certain even a U.S. deputy marshal would have had no jurisdiction in Deadwood in 1876. This was not legally the United States. This was Lakota land, plain and simple, and every man and woman who ventured to the Black Hills did so at their own risk. This is the environment that Hickok and the others were headed into, and I'm sure everybody had their own different reasons for making the trip. Charlie Utter and his brother, for instance, were looking to open up a business, and they would, first selling supplies to prospectors and then starting up their own express mail route. As for Hickok, well, let's just say his motivations, much like the man, were complicated. Remember, Bill was a newlywed. Wife Agnes was still back east, but James Butler was determined to make his own way, to not have to rely on his wife's money. Matter of fact, while Bill allegedly borrowed $22.30, or roughly $600 in today's money, from a Doc Howard before departing Cheyenne, saying that his, quote, remittance hadn't come from the East. Now, if this is true, I can only assume that the remittance Bill was referring to was money from Agnes, seeing as how he himself was not employed. But of course, that is just an assumption on my part. 
Either way, it's never a good feeling not being able to support yourself. Hickok, just like everybody else headed to Deadwood, was hoping to strike it rich. As such, the wagon train departed Cheyenne on June 27, 1876. Now, if you were to make this same trip right now, it would take you about four and a half hours. But a wagon ain't nearly as fast as a Subaru, and as such, it would take this caravan of hopefuls about two weeks, including a brief respite at the ranch of John Hunton along the way, as well as a layover at Fort Laramie. And it was there at Fort Laramie where it's believed the great calamity Jane Cannery joined the expedition, along with a few other working gals. Ladies with names such as Dirty Emma, Titbit, Sizzlin' Kate, Big Dolly, and my favorite, Smooth Boar. Did you know Calamity Jane was just 24 years old back in 1876? Poor thing just had a rough life. Originally from Missouri and orphaned at the age of 14, Jane was forced to make a living any way she could. Dishwasher, waitress, cook, and yeah, prostitute. Now there's a lot of debate about whether or not she went on any of the marvelous adventures that she claimed to have gone on. Scouting for the army and fighting under General Crook and all that. I am in no way a Calamity Jane expert, but I believe much of that has been debunked. Jane was simply a very colorful figure, what we might call a character nowadays, and one hell of a storyteller. Likewise, there's nothing to the rumors of her and Hickok being a couple, despite Cannery claiming that the two were married. It's very likely that she and Bill had never even met until they set off on that wagon trip from Fort Laramie to Deadwood. According to Joseph Wide-Eye Anderson, who was along for the trip, Hickok barely even spoke to Jane on the way to Deadwood, other than occasionally allowing her a drink from his five-gallon keg of whiskey. And if the name Wide-Eye Anderson sounds familiar, you may recall me mentioning him back on the series I did on Liver Eaton Johnson. Mr. Anderson, also known as Oyster Johnny, lived an eventful life to say the least, and a long life, not dying until 1946. Dude lived long enough to see himself portrayed on the big screen. And I still have yet to determine whether or not he's a trusted source. He'd go on in his latter years to pin the book, I Buried Hickok, and I really just need to bite the bullet and get me a copy. As far as this expedition goes, some of the things that Wide Eye claimed are in dispute, while other statements pretty much line up. So like I always say, grain of salt, right? As for Hickok, Wide Eye would recall that the former lawman's eyesight was pretty much gone by this point, and at nighttime he was practically blind. Still, though, Anderson said that every morning, when the light was just right, Hickok would have target practice at about 25 paces, and he never missed anything he shot at. Furthermore, he stated that Bill always carried his revolvers butt forward, oftentimes drawing and firing both simultaneously. Anderson specifically uses the phrase twist of the wrist when describing Hickok's draw. Now, that little tidbit is for listeners Crick Water and Joe Wheeler. We've been having a fun little discussion as to the various methods Hickok would have likely used to carry and draw his pistols, as far as practicality is concerned. Long story short, nobody knows for sure. Uh, it is very likely that Hickok preferred the butt-forward carry, as did many men who spent long hours in the saddle or at the poker table, and he likely utilized the twist-and-draw method as opposed to the cross-draw. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Finally, on June 12, 1876, the expedition reached the bustling boomtown of Deadwood, a hell of a place to make a living. James Butler Hickok would only have 21 more days left to live. Believe it or not, Bill would locate a mining claim of his own during his first day or so in camp. Or at least he said as much to his wife when he wrote to her on July 17th, stating that he had just been out prospecting and had plans to return the next day. That letter notwithstanding... Any information regarding Hickok's time prospecting is as scant as scant can be. Unless, of course, he was referring to panning for gold at the poker table, a vocation that would soon draw the ex-marshal's full attention. As such, he began making the rounds, gambling at his preferred establishments, places like the Senate, Shingles No. 3, and Mans No. 10. Not to be confused with Mans No. 69420. No word, however, on whether or not Wild Bill ever made it over to that whoremonger and cocksucker Al Swearingen's joint, the gym. Although if he had, I like to think the pussy would have been half-priced, and unauthorized cinnamon and canned fucking peaches readily goddamn available, ad hoc free gratis. Sorry, uh, that's for all the Deadwood fans out there. I apologize. Also, for anybody who has seen the amazing HBO series Deadwood, in case you're curious, it is very unlikely that Wild Bill and future Deadwood lawman Seth Bullock ever knew each other, as Bullock would not arrive in Deadwood until August 1st, the day before Hickok, well, you know. 
Now, Bill and Charlie Utter would camp out there together, just across the creek from town, along with another old friend of theirs, California Joe, real name Moses Milner. About a decade older than Hickok, California Joe was every bit as capable. He did a lot of scouting work back in Kansas in the 1860s, probably where he and Bill first met. And whereas Hickok was expert with a pistol, California Joe was said to be hell with a long gun. And it was Joe, not Wild Bill, who was indeed promoted as Custer's chief of scouts. And it was also Joe who was quickly demoted when, in 1870, he got so blind drunk that the 7th Cav had to bundle him up in the back of a damn wagon. A chief of scouts that can't sit a saddle ain't worth much, I reckon. Nevertheless, Joe and Hickok were good friends, and they, along with Charlie Utter, were often observed walking the streets and frequenting the saloons of Deadwood. That said, Wild Bill wasn't quite the same as he had been during his days in Kansas. And mostly for the same reasons we've already discussed. The issues with his eyesight, his rheumatism, a lack of steady income. Hell, he had to borrow money just to get to Deadwood, and once there, per one source, borrowed money damn near every day from Charlie Utter. And he had taken to drinking upon waking up, which is never a good sign. You start reaching for that bottle first thing in the morning, and the disease pretty much has you at that point. Now, I'm not going to sit here and claim to know whether or not Wild Bill was an alcoholic. All I will say is that as somebody who's had my own battles with the drink, there are signs. And Hickok undeniably began exhibiting a few red flags. Speaking of addictions, you ever see that movie Wild Bill starring Jeff Bridges? Hickok is portrayed in this particular film as being quite the fan of opium, but I'm not really sure what that was based on. I couldn't find much other than vague references to both Wild Bill and Kit Carson at various times utilizing opium dens. Per a 2015 article published by CBS Philadelphia titled The Heroin Epidemic, quote, Before heroin was first shot into the veins, there were opium dens scattered throughout the American West. The wealth of this drug has been attributed to the Chinese immigrants who first arrived to work on the railroads. Even while Bill Hickok and Kit Carson preferred these dens to saloons, end quote. Is this true? I can find zero sources other than a variation of what I just said scattered across various websites. Nor was there any mention of opium in any of the books that I have on Hickok and Carson. That said, I don't know everything and I damn sure ain't read everything. I do think, however, we can wholesale discount the part about them preferring opium dens to saloons. Hell, Wild Bill practically lived in saloons, and Carson was never much of a social butterfly to begin with. Would it have been possible for either man to sample opium? Sure, absolutely. I mean, one thing both of these guys had in common was chronic pain. And in those days, opium was readily available, as was a number of fun-time substances that we can't just easily obtain nowadays. And if it could be proven that either one of these guys took to puffing on an opium pipe, I do not think that's some sort of damning blight on their honor. But with all that said, I also very strongly question the assertion that they did, or at least to any significant extent. If you have any information on this, actual sources, please do enlighten me. Josh at WildWestExtra.com Now Bill's appearance there in Deadwood did cause quite the stir. Remember, he was a famous man at this junction of his life. But not all of the attention he attracted was the welcome sort. The lawless element of the boomtown, particularly those who fancied themselves in charge of Deadwood's more crooked activities, were especially concerned. After all, Hickok had been called in to tame the rough towns of Abilene and Hayes. Did he intend to do the same thing there in Deadwood? If so, that means a lot of ill-gotten money would soon dry up and maybe more than a few unsolved murders would be examined. More on this criminal element to come, but for now... Let's go ahead and take a look at Bill's last days. There are some who assert Hickok was suffering from depression, and we know he was losing heavily at poker, which caused him to continue to borrow money. And he also began having premonitions of his own death, allegedly telling his buddy Charlie and possibly others that he sensed Deadwood would be his last camp. Per one source, Utter even tried to get Bill to join him on a hunting trip just to get him out of town. An invitation that Hickok quickly rejected, saying, quote, Those fellers over the creek have laid it out to kill me, and they're going to do it or they ain't. Anyway, I don't stir out of here unless I'm carried out. End quote. Now, this is just me speaking, but I have heard of similar premonitions, especially among men at war. The strange phenomenon of foreseeing one's own imminent demise. I do personally believe that there is more to this world that we mere mortals can see. 
But I do think on rare occasions we're given a glimpse behind the veil, if only darkly, and if only just for a moment, especially when our time starts winding down. But like I said, this is just me talking, and I have been known to speak out of my ass more than once. Still, though, even on August 1st, Hickok was said to have once again reflected on his upcoming death while leaning against the door of the number 10 saloon watching the masses in the street hustle past. He even hinted at it in the letter he penned to his wife, his last letter that he wrote earlier that morning. Agnes Darling, if such should be, we never meet again while firing my last shot, I will gently breathe the name of my wife, Agnes. And with wishes even for my enemies, I will make the plunge and try to swim to the other shore. Signed, J.B. Hickok, Wild Bill. Later that day, as was his habit, Hickok returned to play poker, each time asserting his usual right to sit at the table with his back facing the wall, a precaution he picked up years earlier. At some point that evening, a youngster by the name of Jack McCall sat in on a game, and for once, Hickok didn't lose. By the time the two were done, McCall was dead-ass broke, and Bill had pity on him, tossing the loser enough money to buy supper, a gesture that Jack rejected. Not a whole lot is known about Jack McCall's earlier life, other than him being from Kentucky. His real name was John, by the way, not Jack, something that didn't come to light until his second trial. It's been written that McCall drifted west to hunt buffalo originally and that he possibly drove one of the wagons in Charlie Utter and Hickok's expedition to Deadwood. Just 24 or 25 years of age in 1876, McCall was then going by the alias Bill Sutherland, but was also known at various times as Broken Nose Jack. And yeah, we will be discussing him a lot more very shortly. The next day would be August 2nd. Bill dressed in all of his finery, including his favorite Prince Albert frock coat, and sometime around midday, made his way to Nuttle and Man's number 10 saloon. Only this time, nobody offered up their seats to Hickok, at least not the ones that he preferred, offering him a full view of the surroundings while keeping his back to the wall. Bill's fellow gamblers started ribbing him, laughing off his paranoia and just telling him to relax. And against his better judgment, Hickok finally relented and sat down anyways. He would still have a clear view of the front door, but not the smaller entrance to his rear. And as was the norm, Bill began losing badly. He even headed to the bar at one point to borrow 15 bucks from the house. Around 3 p.m., Jack McCall entered the establishment. Some would later claim he seemed drunk as he moved to the bar, working his way slowly down, unnoticed by Hickok who at the time was having a friendly argument with fellow poker player and riverboat captain, Bill Massey, a distraction that allowed Jack to approach Bill from behind, once again unnoticed. Halting just a few paces away, McCall drew a revolver, aimed it at the back of Hickok's head, and pulled the trigger, yelling out, damn you, take that, while doing so. And so it were that at 39 years of age, James Butler Hickok met his end. They say Bill's head jerked forward as the bullet exited through his right cheek between the upper and lower jaw bones. The rest of his body remained motionless for several seconds before slowly toppling to the floor. As for the coward McCall, he waved his pistol at the crowd as he backed out of the saloon, even squeezing the trigger, but it misfired. Turning to run, he hopped on the first horse he found, but being the damn fool he was, the saddle turned upside down and spilt Jack into the muck of the thoroughfare and within minutes he was apprehended. While Bill's body remained locked inside the number 10 in the meantime, word of what had happened reached Charlie Utter, who was out of town, but soon came rushing in to see his friend one last time and claim the body. It would be Charlie who'd bury Bill, placing him in a pine coffin, white cloth lining the inside with black draping the exterior. The next morning, citizens of Deadwood came to pay their respect at Charlie's camp, filing past Hickok's coffin until that evening when he was laid to rest in the Ingleside Cemetery. Not for long, though. Uh, three years later, to the day, Charlie Utter paid to have Bill's body reinterred to the new Mount Moriah Cemetery, where he now reposes. Story goes that Bill's mama was found with a newspaper reporting her son's death laying at her side, slowly rocking back and forth, blood covering her dress as she suffered from a lung hemorrhage. The Hickok family would state that she never fully recovered from the shock and was still mourning her son two years later when she passed away. Now, Jack McCall, as I said, was quickly apprehended, placed under guard, despite there being no formal law there in Deadwood. And instead of just quickly stringing the man up to the nearest pole, the local business leaders decided to have a trial, one that would be held in McDaniel's Theater, 
A judge was selected, as was the jury. Attorneys were appointed and not one to waste any time. The proceedings would begin the day after Hickok's death on August 3rd. Eyewitness testimony was heard and even McCall got his chance to speak, saying that he killed Wild Bill as an act of revenge. According to him, Hickok had gunned down his brother years ago in Abilene. After some back and forth with the lawyers, the judge ordered the jury to their chambers with the verdict to be read at Man's Number 10 Saloon where Bill was murdered. And the verdict was an astonishing not guilty. Upon hearing this, several men, including Charlie Utter, simply walked out in disgust. Some even openly speaking about Lynch and McCall right there on the spot. Nevertheless, the assassin was set free. And believe it or not, Jack did not immediately leave town. At least not till old California Joe showed up and made it clear that Jack could either arm himself or get the hell gone. Needless to say, McCall got gone. So obviously justice was not served, right? I mean, there is no dispute whatsoever about Jack murdering Hickok. Everybody in their mama knows that it was him who walked into that saloon and put a bullet in the back of Bill's head. To let such a killing go unpunished, lawless town or not, didn't sit well with more than a few people, one of which was a Colonel George May, the prosecuting attorney during the trial. He, along with a deputy marshal out of Wyoming named A.D. Balcom, tracked Jack down to Laramie where the fool had been bragging about killing the famous Wild Bill. And it was there in Laramie where McCall was arrested, first taken to Cheyenne and finally Yankton, this time for a real trial. Now I know what you're thinking, double jeopardy. I mean, once you're acquitted of a crime or found not guilty, you ain't supposed to be tried again on the same charges. But like I keep saying, Deadwood was an illegal town on illegal land. Any acts committed by a vigilance committee, such as the one who originally tried Jack for Hickok's murder, would not be officially recognized. So legally, this second trial was not double jeopardy. That said, for old Jack, it would be final jeopardy. He would be tried again, and this time it would be all legal-like. McCall, described as a restless, medium-sized man with slightly crossed eyes and a speech impediment, continued on with his claims about Wild Bill killing his brother, and he even said that Bill had robbed him of some gold dust during a poker game, and that he slapped Hickok across the face because of it. And I hope everybody who heard him say that had their boots on because the shit was getting a little high. Now in October of 76, before the trial even began, McCall unsuccessfully tried to escape from jail. After this failed attempt, and probably thinking he had screwed up any chance at a fair trial, he then made a startling offer. He said he would turn state witness. And this is the part that really surprised me. A bit of information I had thus far never heard, and I'm really astonished that it's not more well known. I know he may not be the most reliable source, but according to Jack, uh, John Varnes of Deadwood paid him a certain sum of money to murder Hickok. A statement somewhat backed up by Jack only having $43 on his person when he was apprehended for Hickok's killing. But the very next day when he was set free, he was seen sporting a fancy gold watch and a big fat wad of cash. So who the hell was this John Varnes guy? And if it's true, why would he want Hickok killed? Unfortunately, and much to my great frustration, I couldn't find much. Varnes was a gambler there in Deadwood, possibly a saloon owner, and he did have a reputation as a dangerous man. He, along with a Tim Brady, allegedly conspired to have Hickok killed, fearing that he'd soon pin on a badge and put an end to their easy money. Word is they tried to enlist the help of fellow gambler Charlie Storms and gunman Jim Levy, but both men wisely turned down the offer. And it was Varnes and Brady whom McCall named, saying that they were the ones that paid him to take Bill out. Now what little I could find out about Varnes, uh, evidently he was a big time player there in Deadwood, as I alluded to, as far as crime was concerned. And the trouble with him and Bill went all the way back to Denver with the two renewing their quarrel in Deadwood. One allegation has Varnes and another man get into an altercation in the Senate saloon and while Bill pulling his pistol and holding it on Varnes as he attempted to mediate the situation. Another guy I just mentioned, Charlie Storms, he and John Varnes got into a shootout right there in the streets of Deadwood with both men emptying their guns at each other and not hitting a damn thing. Eventually they called it quits and just went and got drunk together. Now, Charlie Storms I am a little familiar with. I spoke of him on the episode I did on Luke Short and the Dodge City War. Storms was an old school gambler, one of them old boys who followed the money from one boomtown to another. He'd eventually end up in Tombstone where he made the fatal mistake of throwing down on Luke Short. Let's just say that this was Mr. Storms' last gamble and it weren't no win in hand. Now, both John Varnes and Tim Brady were sent for during this second trial. 
but they were not located. And I guess the issue was just kind of dropped. By the way, good luck Google and Tim Brady. Dude's name is just a little too close to a certain athlete. As for Varnes, uh, the most I could find out about the rest of his life were some unverified claims that he returned to Colorado and died an opium fiend. Now, maybe I'm missing something here. Maybe this allegation that McCall was paid off has been soundly disproven and I'm just not aware of it. But the general narrative surrounding Wild Bill's death, as far as the motive goes, always just points to Jack McCall being angered after losing to Bill in poker and Bill's insult of offering to pay for the man's dinner. We know that Hickok did not kill Jack's brother. That has been debunked. And I guess we all just kind of took it for granted and accepted the fact that Jack was a small cowardly man who simply wanted to kill the famous Bill Hickok. With this new information, however, it does kind of make a little bit more sense. And if Jack was indeed paid to kill Hickok, then I, for one, would certainly love to learn more. For what it's worth, John S. McClintock, an early pioneer of Deadwood, wrote years afterwards in his memoirs that these allegations regarding Varnes had no foundation. So who knows? Here's a fun little side note. As recently as 2012, Val Kilmer was slated to play John Varnes, in a movie titled The Hard Ride, with Elizabeth Shue starring as Agnes Hickok. According to IMDb, however, the movie is still in development, which probably means it'll never be made. So there you go. Make all of that what you will. If you have any information regarding John Varnes or Tim Brady and what became of either men after leaving Deadwood, or any other information regarding their role in Wild Bill's death, please hit me up at josh at wildwestextra.com. The trial would officially begin on December 4th, 1876, and last a total of two days. This time, McCall was found guilty and sentenced to hang, and there in court when the verdict was read was Hickok's brother, Lorenzo. When he got word back in Illinois of his younger sibling's murder, the ever-meek and mild Lorenzo retrieved an old 36 caliber Colt from a trunk at home and set out for Dakota Territory, looking to make things right. Of course, once he got there, not only was Jack already under arrest, but the trial was just getting started, so Lorenzo just consoled himself knowing justice would soon be served. Now, there was one other revelation that came out during this trial, something you may find as curious as I did. Turns out this might not have been Jack McCall's first attempt at trying to assassinate Hickok. More than one witness testified that days before Wild Bill's murder, McCall has slowly approached him with a revolver, only to have several people intervene and pull him away. I find this interesting because there's no record of Hickok being aware of this when it happened, nor of anybody telling him about it. And if they had told him about it, if he knew he was in danger, then you'd think he would have been more cautious on August 2nd. Or, I don't know, perhaps Wild Bill was so numb to people trying to kill him that it didn't give him much cause for alarm. Or it's simply not true, I don't know. The wheels of justice turn slow even in 1876, at least they do when everything is done by the books. There were appeals, but in the end, Jack was to hang by the neck on the morning of March 1st, 1877, nearly seven months after he put Hickok under. It were a Thursday, and this was to be the first legal hanging to ever take place there in Yankton County. At 8.30 a.m., Jack had a final consultation with a priest. He was, after all, human, and as such, susceptible to the very human need to find religion when you're about to meet your maker. By around 9 a.m., the marshal arrived at the jail to read Jack his death warrant. At approximately 9.30, McCall bid farewell to his cellmates and was led outside into the drizzling rain, a rain that did not stop a large crowd from congregating. Jack was then taken up to the gallows, his arms bound as he knelt to pray. Upon rising, a black burlap sack was placed over his head, followed by a noose around the neck. Draw it tighter, marshal, Jack urged. Finally, at 10.15 a.m., the trap was sprung. Jack McCall's last words were, Oh, God. He would be pronounced dead 12 minutes later and laid to rest in the Sacred Heart Cemetery there in Yankton. As for everybody else, uh, Charlie Utter would have quite a few years left on this earth. He'd continue working in various mining towns like Leadwood and Durango before moving on down south to Socorro, New Mexico, and eventually way down south to Panama. And it was there in Panama that he would die in July of 1915 at the age of 73. California Joe Milner would not be so fortunate. He'd only last about three months after Hickok's death, himself being killed in the same fashion, shot from behind. Bill's widow Agnes would have a monument placed at his grave, and 
then return back to work performing for the circus. She had a child, but one from before she and Bill ever got married. And once Agnes was too old to perform, she lived with said child, a daughter, until finally passing away in 1907 at the age of 80. She now rests in Cincinnati, buried next to her first husband. And old Calamity Jane lasted probably longer than anybody would have expected. Much like in the HBO series Deadwood, Jane Wood helped nurse the sick through a smallpox epidemic there in the Black Hills before moving on. She would later return, however, but her drinking had just got progressively worse, and she passed away on August 1st, 1903, buried right there in Deadwood next to her crush, Wild Bill Hickok. Now, you may find references to Wild Bill having a few illegitimate children. There was a lady named Jean McCormick, for instance, who claimed to be the love child of Calamity Jane and Hickok. This has been completely disproven, but it does kind of make you wonder, you know, did Hickok have any children? And the answer is maybe. You may recall from a previous installment that I mentioned a fortune teller named Indian Annie, who Hickok stayed with back there in Kansas. Well, her real name, we think, was Anna Wilson. And she did have a child named Willie in 1867. Many think that this was Wild Bill's kid and that he abandoned the boy who would sadly pass away in 1881 at just 13 or 14 years of age. This is total speculation, though, and there is no official record of Hickok having any children of his own. He does have quite a few notable relations, however, at least according to the totally reputable website, FamousKin.com. According to them, the Bush boys, George W. and Jeb with an exclamation mark, are second cousins five times removed from Wild Bill. Likewise with Christopher Lloyd, you may remember him as Doc from Back to the Future. Him and Hickok are fifth cousins two times removed. And the list goes on. Zach Efron, Billie Eilish, Taylor Swift, Humphrey Bogart, Bill Gates. I finally had to stop reading the list. Every famous person you can imagine is supposedly related to Wild Bill Hickok. And I'm not even joking. Look it up. Chris Pratt, Rain Wilson, literally everybody. Look, I don't know if they are indeed related to Hickok or not. And I had never heard of this website before doing this episode. But I did recall hearing years ago that former President Obama and Hickok were related. So I went searching for an actual reliable source. And sure enough, per the New England Historical Society, Obama and Hickok are six cousins, six times removed. Whatever that means. Evidently, the two family trees go all the way back to a Thomas Blossom of Holland, who immigrated to Plymouth way back in 1629. So there you have it. I don't know about where you're from, but down here in my neck of the woods, we don't have all that five times or six times removed business. She's either your first cousin, your second cousin, or she's fair game. You know what I mean? All right, with that, I think we've about wrapped up the life of Wild Bill Hickok. Wait, no, we have not. No, we have not. I'm getting ahead of myself. No episode on the death of Wild Bill could be complete without addressing the dead man's hand. If you've ever played poker, you know what it is, right? Two pair, aces and eights. The same hand that Bill had been dealt right before Jack McCall put that bullet into the back of his head. Or so we're told. Is that true? Probably not. The idea that while Bill had aces and eights did not appear in print until 1926, a half century after his death, and it had no contemporaneous sources. Meaning nobody who was there ever mentioned it. And before that, the dead man's hand was described as a full house consisting of three jacks and a pair of tens. Per Hoyle's 1907 edition, a dead man's hand is jacks and eights as opposed to aces and eights. Truth of the matter is, nobody knows what cards Wild Bill was holding at the time of his death. That said, I have never been dealt aces and eights without taking at least a moment to think about Wild Bill. And I hope going forward, you do the same. All right, now we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for staying with me. Hope this three-part series wasn't too long. I hope I did Hickok justice. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody supporting the podcast via Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, and YouTube memberships. Link in the show notes if you too would like to contribute. And please, if you like what you hear, share this podcast with somebody. Till next time, keep your back to the wall, especially if you try bluffing with aces and eights. Adios.
Hawk free gratis.